Uh, okay. Uh, the second speaker is Dr. Song Hoon. Uh, he'll talk about the correlating the WMS with Higgs coupling. So please start. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks a lot for the organizers making up this very nice workshop so, so that we can share about our ideas about WMS and also possible uh, new, new physics ideas about it. So today, yes, I will uh, share with you my recent speculation with uh, Carlos Wagner and Lian Tao Wang at the University of Chicago about possible correlation between shift in the WMS we would like to make because we want to believe in the new physics and then associated shift in the Higgs couplings. I will, I will discuss exactly what kind of Higgs coupling I'm talking about and so how strong that is. And so what should we expect in the future if, if a CDF uh, uh, result is true? Okay, so that's the line of reasoning. So I will tell you a pretty simple uh, story about it. So hopefully I can go slow and then hopefully I can uh, discuss somebody in detail. But if not, please uh, feel free to jump in and interrupt and then just ask questions. Okay, let's get started. So already uh, previous speaker reviewed very good uh, about basics about the CDF measurements. So I don't have to go to a lot of details today. So let me just say that, uh, yes, we got new result and we, we learned that compared to the standard model by which I mean, uh, there is a precision electric, fit, uh, electric precision fit data. So compared to that, uh, CDF told us that if I want to believe in the CDF uh, result, we want to have a shift of, of the size of a 76 MEB and then with the precision of 9 MEB. So this is pretty precise and pretty large shift we are talking about, all right? But another aspect of, also, so here is the result. We already seen this, so I don't have to go through this, this plot again. But another interesting thing about the CDF measurement is Zeebo's MS uh, measurement, right? So uh, as also previous speaker reviewed, uh, they, uh, first of all, found, got the measurement of the z and mass, which is consistent with the today's world average. But this is not enough, but there is a, we should understand what's going on behind the scene. First of all, the way they extracted the z and mass is not by fitting that to what they wanted to get. Instead, they calibrated the momenta in COT, central auto tracking drift chamber, using other particles like say psi or upsilon. And then they use those calibration to now actually measure instead of the fit to the data. And then the outcome is completely consistent with the world average. Okay, this is, I think is impressive. Also very strong uh, check or confirmation about their systematics. Of course, there are many subtle other systematics that I'm not, I'm not very aware of, but at the, at the very least, this is good news. So combine, combining these two facts, meaning the measurement of the W mass together with the Z was a mass, then we'll learn something, right? So basically, it is saying that the MZ is consistent within the same systematics, MW is not, right? So that's the fact. And we know how to phrase these two, these two fa facts, right, in one formula, right? So in, there is a, form, a, a parameter called the row parameter, uh, which is basically measuring the ratio of the W mass to that of Z mass, okay? Which is one in standard model with this parameter. Now we have learned just that the, from the CDF, if we, if we believe in the CDF two collaboration result, that means that we need to change in this quantity, right? And uh, what that means is that we need to have extra fit new physics, which also provide us extra custodial symmetry breaking. Okay, so uh, of course there are other types of solutions in the literature trying to explain this phenomena without necessarily invoking T, t parameter, which I will get to. But but then uh, but then I think to, at, at zero total level, I think. What's really going on is that there's a new physics with extra concerted symmetry violation. So, uh, so what kind of new physics we are talking about, right? So, we, so again, uh, uh, today's my, my talk's assumption is that I want to believe in the CDF result, which is, uh, to my mind, is pretty uh, uh, convincing and strong in terms of systematics and uh, many facts. So, uh, I want to go along the direction of new physics. And I want to uh, figure out what kind of new physics we are talking about in general. Um, I don't want to pick out specific theory or model and then just hammer that. That's a great job to do. Uh, as we have seen amazing work talk from the previous talk. But here, I want you to be a little bit of a model independent approach, okay? So what, what kind of new physics we, we are talking about here? So I, as I talked about, we want to have a shift in the row parameter, which is related to the T parameter in terms of uh, STU parameter. And more generally, WMS shift can be written in this way if we have extra source of S, T, and U. 
Um, but in the language of effective field theory operator language, S operator corresponds to this mixing of the W with hypercharged dimension six operator. And T operator is this operator, which basically captures extra custodial symmetry violation, which is also dimension six operator. And U corresponds to dimension A, so I won't be talking about this operator too much. So uh, primarily I will use these two parameter to capture new physics effect. Okay, now I just realized I might have it too fast. Yes. Right. So remember, uh, if, if so, in order to in order not to have a violation, basically you want to have a trace. So in other words, okay, more precisely, custodial symmetry breaking. In order to see, so I will have a discussion about that, but let me just answer because you're asking. In order to see that, first of all, uh, this is the SU two L just double F. You want to form uh, uh, H, you want to form by double F by having a two, two, two by two matrix, uh, which is H tilde and then H. Okay, uh, vertically, this is S, SU2 direction, but also you're generating SU2 R direction. So in order to really see the manifest custodial symmetry invariance, you want to form using this two by two now uh, by double F, and you want to trace at every indices. So you have you want to have a contraction of any matrix indices and a trace of the, over that. But this obviously doesn't have a trace over, for example, SU to R direction. This does have a nice trace over SU to L direction. So it captures uh, a violation along that direction. So cost certain symmetry violation. But I will get to that point a little bit more, and I will discuss a little a little bit about that. Yes. Right. So this is the same alpha. That's right. Yes. This is the uh, this is the uh, one over 128 at the relevant scale we are talking about. Okay, one, 137 is very low, low, low oh, energy. Alpha. Yeah, it is that alpha. alpha yeah, phi structure constant. Yes, yeah, this is phi structure constant. Any other question? Okay, good. So, for what you know, u scale, u physics scale, can you explain? For example, let's first ask a very bottom of question, right? For what size of S and T can we explain CDFMW, right? So, so use, I'm using this formula again, and then uh, Streamia did a job of doing the fitting of this thing, but roughly speaking, if I translate this plot in terms of size of S and T parameter I need to explain MW shift, it's roughly 0.1 for the T parameter, but if you allow also, so if you want to explain this shift only using T parameter without, without S, well, what I'm saying is that you need to have roughly 0.1 or so, but you also if turn on S parameter effect because it comes with the negative size, you can crank up a little bit of S at the price of having a slightly larger T parameter because you, there's a cancellation effect, that's the answer. But overall, in terms of uh, scale, the size we're talking about can be translated into the, you know, this dimension six operator with a denominator of being a two TeV to the square. So we're talking about something two TeV, but I'm not saying that there is a new physics at two, six, sorry, did I say two TeV? Yeah. Six TeV. So this is a six, right? So, so some, some six TV thing, but we still have to interpret whether this is actually new physics scale or just number for now. So, but I'm just telling you for now that there's a numerical number of six TV just coming from this fact. Okay, so now let's think, okay? This is the result, let's, let's interpret. I just plug this in here, everything, yes. So this is effective scale. So now let's ask, what does this mean? Okay. So if mu physics that generates the S and T parameter dimension six operator happens at the tree level, then I can view this operator being generated via some exchange of a tree level physics with the uh, you know, strength of the coupling at, of the new physics sector with the same color degrees of freedom, possible number of a flavor number of degrees of freedom, this should match onto the one over six TeV square. And roughly that means that the new physics scale, we're talking about this. So it's order one TeV, okay? That can be slightly lower because of the coupling suppression, but it also it can be slightly larger because of the multiplicity in S. However, if, if we are talking about loop induces S and T parameter, then there's extra loop factor, roughly speaking, then that translates into the actual new physics scale being roughly 500 GeV, Time some factors. Okay. Now, majority of theory in, in the literature out there, also including compositics and this and the Suzy models, 
are mostly loop-induced physics. So I will focus on the loop-induced physics. Then what we are talking about is that we are talking about some sort of new physics around the 500 GV plus minus because of the, these factors. Okay, so that's the first thing. Now I want to go one step forward. What does that mean in general? Okay, that's my question. So let me move on. Unless if, if any, any question, okay, good. So now I want to talk about correlating MW shift to with uh, some other uh, Higgs couplings. Okay, what do I mean by that? First of all, as we have just seen, large shift in W mass requires new physics in the electric sector, right? I need to have an extra source of custody of symmetry violation. And those new physics in the electric sector can be best phrased in terms of a universal new physics fact. In other words, uh, it can be phrased in terms of correction to the self, self uh, energy bubble diagram like this. And then this again, can be translated into basically SNP primer, as I have talked about. Now, as I mentioned earlier, for loop induced SNP parameter, we are talking about roughly speaking around the 500 GeV new scale. It can be seven, it can be eight, but detail, it's details. Okay, that's fact number one, two, three. Okay, so I want to have a large shift, new physics in the electric sector. And for new loop induced physics, we're talking about new, new physics get around the 500 GeV. That's fact number one. Good. Fact number two, in standard model, there exist loop-induced Higgs couplings. Here, loop-induced is important part. So let me go through what I mean by that. So first of all, the first example of loop-induced coupling is the Higgs to glue glue. Okay, obviously there is no tree-level coupling because Higgs is colorless, right? And then one can estimate, and here uh, the dominant contribution comes from top loop, you can estimate to be this. The second important example of loop-induced coupling the standard model is Higgs to gamma gamma. Again, the uh, dominant contribution comes from the W loop, and the subleading contribution comes from the uh, top loop. And you can, you can compute the uh, size, it looks like this. So this numerical value is from the W loop, this numerical value is from the top loop. Okay, what's the point here? So we're talking about 500 GV or so new physics, which is within the, uh, within the electric sector. In standard model, there are two, actually one more, which is gamma Z, two or three loop in this coupling. Therefore, it starts with a very small si in size. Okay. Now, if I have a new physics around the 500 GeV compared to either one or 200 GeV standard model contribution, it will generically make a uh, shift or contribution to these couplings, which will be significant in size already. Okay. So how generic the tendency is? That's the question. But at least on just based on the general discussion here, at least, right? We see that there should be some shift in those couplings. If so, the really the question is what will be the size in quantity, whether we are already constrained by the LHC precision today, or we get to see something new soon. So that's the question. So that, 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 that is the question I'm phrasing. So um, the strategy we took is that we took some of general new physics models, which I will explain what I mean by that. And then we investigated whether there's a possible correlation between MW shift and uh, shift in these Higgs couplings. And also I will touch on uh, other correlation with other observable effect too. So that, that's the question. Higgs to gamma Z, yeah, so there's that. The... That's right. So, so here I just didn't mention for simplicity's sake, but it's there. Uh, however, I, I, will, I will discuss, for example, today's precision about these two couplings are order 5% uh, level, but for Z gamma, it's at the level of 30%. Okay, so it's, it provides us a less uh, strong uh, constraint on the theory space. But, but yes, in principle, we have to investigate this too. Also, it is harder to measure compared to these two because this one goes into the Higgs production, this goes into the clean uh, decay channel, it's very easy to measure, but Z gamma becomes harder, that's why. But, but conceptually, yes, you're right. Okay, so uh, we took uh, two models, for example, fermion model. So how would you make a general model, right? So here's the electric sector. There's SU2 cross U1 gauge symmetry. So you, you hypothesize some sort of, some number of uh, doublets fermion and singlet fermion and try to write down general interactions, right? So here is the Higgs. You try to write down general Yukawa couplings, mass sums of each of them, and in principle, one can write down something like this also for the other sectors too. So there are a little bit of more terms in principle we can write down, but I believe that that will not change the qualitative uh, message that I want to deliver today. 
Okay, so again, the idea is that you take some number of doublets, some number of a singlet, you try to write down general interactions to the standard model sector through the Higgs, and then you investigate the, the meaning of that. Okay, we are supplied with the scalar models. Again, you just consider some number of a SU2 doublet, some number of a singlet. You can assume whether they are colored or not. That's a, another discrete choice one can make. Then again, you write down possibly general interactions, right? For example, you can write the master of each of them. You can write down the quartic interactions between the singlets or doublets. You can write down the cubic interactions. You can write down general interactions, okay? And then you try to see what happens. That's the idea. And of course, some choice of this parameter, for example, will correspond to Suji sector. Some choice of this parameter will correspond to two X doublet sector and so on and so forth. So, Yeah, sorry, these are singlet scalars. These are scalar doublet. And then you try, I just try to write down some general interactions among those. Uh, you mean the scalar combined with the fermion? Yeah, it will be, so, okay. It will be, the, all the plots I will show eventually, it will be linear combination of conceptually, but we haven't done technically that. But that's a good question. If you had, uh, you know, combinations of these two, what happens? So that's a great question. Yeah, I think in principle it can be done. So for now, we've been just focusing separately as a modular discussion. Yeah, yeah yes, oh. but that's right. But you're right, so in principle, one can, we, we can play that game too. Yeah, okay. So for the, just for the sake of time, I'll just focus on one model, which is slightly simpler to discuss, okay? But the, the idea is basically the same. So here's the model. Again, there is a two, for example, doublet, coupled to Higgs with a singlet, with the Yukawa coupling Y and Y2. I, I combine two doublet to write down its own Dirac mass. I combine two singlet to write down its own Dirac mass too. Okay, so that's the idea. Now, mass spectrum, of course, again, top, the, the doublet will have a top component, the bottom component. And then all you want to remember from this slide is that out of this thing, basically there are three mass eigenstates. Okay, there's a heavy top component mass eigenstate, Dirac. There's a light, top component of the mass eigenstate, there's a bottom mass eigenstate. There are three mass eigenstates, okay? And there are some formulas that we can write down. The whole point of this formula eventually is that the mass of the top sector particles are function of electroweak bad V, of course, other parameters. So the, the only masses I want to deliver from this slide is that you should view this as a mass as a function of V, which also knows about the Higgs eventually, which I will use uh, momentarily, okay? Good. Now, um, again, I want to compute like shift the WMS and this and that. I want to be able to compute the S and T parameter from this theory and analytic results are av available in the literature. It is a long, I even stopped it here. There are many more terms and they all can write down uh, S parameter too, which is slightly longer than this. All these weird functions, don't worry about it. Those are loop functions. If you look at it, you may like it, you may not like it, but it doesn't matter. All point is that we know the, those functions. One can, in principle, compute it, okay? I'm just telling you that we, we, there is an analytic control over, over this computation. That's all the point. Now, let's actually uh, discuss a little bit of physics of this theory. So, first of all, in order to understand the shift in the W mass, we want to understand theoretically what will be the SU2 custodial symmetry breaking parameter in this, in this theory, right? Then we, we, we can understand the physics of it. Remember, given a Higgs doublet H, I form bi doublet, as I say. So there is the H already, and then there's H tilde, which is epsilon SU2 tensor epsilon times H star. So it's a CP conjugate of that. So it's a two to two matrix, two by two matrix, right? And this doublet will transform as L phi, where L is or original, you know, SU2 L acting on to, from, the, from the left. Also, there is a our dagger, which acts on the, the horizontal direction. Okay. So once this guy got a VAV, which is the same thing as saying that the H got a VAV, then this will break this SU to left cross SU to right down to diagonal sector, which is called the custodial SU2 symmetry. Now, remember that AR, SU to R, acts horizontally on this two by two matrix. Remember, and that, which means that R treats basically H and H tilde in an identical manner. That's what he wanted to do, right? The fact that there is a SU to R symmetry means that I'm treating H and the H tilde in the same way. That's what it means. Therefore, 
Because so the symmetry breaking means that whatever the parameter that treats H and H tilde separately, differently. That's the custodial symmetry breaking parameter. If you look at this, now you can, you can say that, right? There's H, there's H tilde. Therefore, if Y1 is different from the Y2, then this theory will have extra custodial symmetry violation. And one can understand the same way also for the scalar model. Basically, this is idea. So the difference between the two Yukawa will be the main, in this case, the custodial symmetry violation. Okay, good. Now let's talk about the computation of the shift in the gauge coupling a little bit. Oh, sorry, the Higgs to the Higgs coupling a little bit, and then I will move on to uh, I show you some 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 something. All right. So um, here, if the new physics scale m is modestly larger than v, it can be a factor of two larger or three larger. It can be much much larger. Then in this uh, shift in the gauge coupling can be computed using what's what's known as a Higgs low energy theorem. Here, here is the idea. So here is the, for example, let's look at the gamma gamma part, right? And I know there's a new physics uh, with the mass scale M, which has a V dependency. In it. Okay, remember, I, I told you that the, the top sector mass has a V dependency, in it, right? I, I stressed that a little before. Now I say, okay, if I integrate this heavy, heavy physics, then it will correct the gauge coupling renormalization if it is charged. It will also correct a color coupling renormalization if it is also colored. Right, so here is the equation that's showing the running of, in this case, uh, uh, the uh, photon gauge coupling renormalization. Right, there's a beta function coefficient and the e, e square over 16 pi square usual loop factor. There's a logarithmic run, running factor. Right, and here important point is that the new physics um, has a mass which depends on the Higgs bat b. Now, from this, you can extract the coupling shift of extra contribution of the new physics to this coupling. For example, in this case, Higgs to gamma gamma. Why? Because V, whenever I see V, I can imagine that V has a fluctuation as H, right? So that means that if I expand this logarithmic function as in units of, in small perturbation of H over V, I can read off what is the H over V uh, order term. So once I understand the renormalization group flu, then I can just read off the correction to the coupling. Okay, so that's the strategy. And this works extremely well, again, so long as the new physics scale M is only modestly larger than B. It doesn't need to be few TeV. Already 40, 400 GeV is good, or two, you know, only modestly larger than B. This works. Okay, so, so for, for this theory, for, for this theory, so we just compute it, which is a simple exercise one can do. Then shift in the H gamma gamma divide in units of this, so here, of uh, structure constant alpha over 16 pi, and also shift in the HG glue glue divided by alpha S over 16 pi square has the same factor. So it's, there is a, a fermionic beta function coefficient divided by the mass of the two top sector mass, and then there's these factors. So here, okay, there's a formula. For now, uh, uh, there are many features this, this uh, formula generates. For now, I just want you to you know that, that there is the two factors with the minus sign between the two. Okay, so that's only one I want you to remember now. Yes, so I'm going until 20, roughly 20, 25. Yes, yes. Square, you mean? No, it's actually 16 pi because when I define alpha, I use the one over four pi, that's why. Good point. Yes, any other questions? Good, now I prepared. I told you here is the theory, rather general theory, here's a spectrum. Here is S and T. I told you that there are such a formula. Here is a way of computing the uh, shift in the coupling constant, coupling. Then I'll, I'll, now I talk about some physics with it. Okay. All right. So we, do I see some correlation or relationship among these things? So see, I'm just showing the plot, but I'll, I'll just focus on one of that and then discuss the, some of the physics with it. And, and then I will move on. So for this plot, what, I'm, what, 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 what am I doing here? So here, uh, first I play with a controlled way, meaning I choose a particular mass scale, first of all, and then I say, okay, I'm just gonna vary Yukawa randomly, arbitrarily, and see whether there's correlations. After this discussion, I will move on even more general that I just scan entire parameter space and see whether there's still a correlation. So here, I, was, I just want to start with some controlled example, okay? And then once I understand some, some of the physics with it, then I'll just move on and they play out you know, very general scan. Okay, that's what I'm doing. So for this plot, I fix the mass scale to be six, uh, 700 GeV, and then I impose the fact that, the, say, uh, from the collider mass bound is a 600 GeV, roughly speaking. 
Okay, this is random choice. We can play out the other ones. Here, the point is qual qualitative correlations. Okay, again, mass parameter, I just chose to be 700 GeV as a, as a random choice. And then I say, there is a mass bound from collider searches around the 600 GeV, which is roughly the good number for colored particle. So for, from there, first of all, this contour show mass spectrum. Oh, sorry, sorry, so this, this red dotted part indicates the mass bound. So you have to live between these two, just by imposing those mass bound. Okay, and then there are two contours. There is a, now I'm, I'm looking at the, the correction to the H glue glue coupling compared to the Sena model. And you start with a very large correction from this side, you're going to the smaller, smaller to the zero. You're exiting this side, becoming negative, but larger, larger inside. Okay, so starting with a very big positive, going to the smaller regime, they're exiting this way with a large but negative sign. Okay, yeah. Here, yeah, generic bound. Yeah, so so I'm not sure if there is a model independent color particle searches, but there are many BSM models has a colors, right? Top partners, this and that. There are many searches along the line, Suji models, compositics, this and that. So you can request what will be the current bound. Roughly, it's a seven, 700 GV ballpark. If it is not colored, it can be lower around, I don't know, 300 GV or ballpark. So that's the kind of number you want to remember. And that's why I chose 700 GV as a starting point. Yeah, so th this is the amount that you want to have to explain CD, CDF, and the plus minus 18 is a two, uh, two sigma band. So uh, this blue circle looking shape is where you can explain CDF. You can be consistent with the CDF uh, measurement. Okay, now let's say I want to be consistent with the shift in the Higgs to glue glue coupling. You don't want to make it too large. For example, here it can be 20%. Today, LATC has a precision around the 8%. So this light green area is when the, the, the amount of shift you are making is less than 8%. So you want to live in, first of all, in this band, and then you want to live in here to be consistent with the shift in the coupling. Also, you want to live in between these two red to be consistent with, with the, for example, direct searches. So, yeah. Then this thing will go out if you say mass bound is smaller, will go in if uh, mass bound is higher. So basically, you're shrinking up possible parameter space here. So let's interpret. What, what is the message here? Say I first satisfy the mass bound from direct searches. Okay, I'm here. Say I satisfy the coupling constant shift, so I'm seeing here. So there's an overlap, right? So I can, I can be here. But as soon as I impose the CDF, then I, I should leave here. Then there is a little overlap here, 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 here. So there is a tension. So this is just illustrate possible tension if you combine these, uh, these three physics together. OK? So with that, now let me move on to general uh, searches. So what we have done, given these rather general models, we have done the parameter scan. So here, are, for in this period, there are four parameters. I impose some unitary bound, perturbative unitary bound. I, mean, I can enlarge to the three by, by a little bit pushing out, but that's possible. And then we make a discrete choice whether new physics is colored or not, whether new physics is charged or not, once, which, which you can make a discrete choices. And then the question is, okay, I have seen some strong correlations here, certainly, right? If I improved, if I improve the mass bound just a little bit, I will just rule out this part and I don't have a parameter space completely. So then the question is, if I do much more general parameter scan, will there still be a non-trivial correlation, right? So that's the question. So uh, here is the first result. What am I doing here? So for example, I randomly draw, in this case, 100,000 uh, data point, okay? And then I, I just plot what is the shift in WMS as a, and then and then the shift in the, for example, Higgs to glue glue, the similar plot for the Higgs to gamma gamma. So let's just focus on the first one because it looked the same basically. If you want to explain CDF, you want to live in here, right? In two sigma band or between these two light blue region if you, you're, you're, you're constraining by one sigma band, okay? So, and then as you, you see, as you want to increase a larger, larger shift in WMS, therefore larger, larger T parameter, 
you tend to generate a larger, larger shift in the coupling constant, the coupling shift. Therefore, there is enhanced more and more tension with the, with the current uh, searches. So now you, you might wonder what happened really within this range. Let's ask you to zoom in there. So this is the plot. Again, it's not like a random completely distributed between this band, but there is a correlation here, there. I'm sure if I, I draw a million instead of 100,000, there will be much more pronounced distribution here, there, much less here, right? As you see from here, it's obviously that pattern it gets developed. Now, what's the message here, first of all? Yes, I, I, I want to say that the CDF is good, okay? And then I want to say, then what? Then for this pretty general fermionic model, Okay, we have the similar result for scalar model. Generically, you should expect that the shift in the Higgs to couplings should be, for example, in this case, Higgs to glue glue coupling will be on order of 10% or so. Okay. And in the case of the Higgs to gamma gamma, you expect a, 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 about 2% or 3% or so. Okay, so what is it all, all about? So, so then let me first show you quickly the, the current bound. So this is Atlas search based on 13 TeV data with this amount of luminosity, which is pretty recent. Okay. Now, kappa uh, glue is the measurement. So they say that the, uh, compared to the standard model, uh, today is roughly 0.92, a little bit downside. So downside. And then precision of a plus minus seven or six, therefore roughly 8% precision. Okay. So uh, here you see, I, like I said, if I live between this band, I'm talking of roughly plus minus 10% or 8%. So it's really on the edge now already. So you might have a model of based on some version of formatting model or scalar model that can explain that, but you can be on the edge. So you might be okay now, but let's talk about more. What will happen tomorrow, right? That's the question. In the case of uh, Higgs to uh, gamma gamma, the precision is roughly 5% 5, 5 or 6%. Okay, so let me go back. So that's two to three percent. But again, this is today. So then, what, what will happen in the future? So uh, already, some of the model can be constrained by this consideration. If you haven't looked at it, yeah, you better look at it. However, sensitivity will improve high, high Lumi LHC for sure. But especially lepton collider, it can be one percent or less. Then you obviously will see not only just testing your own model. You can even test the fact whether CEDF can be consistent with this or not, right? In general, almost in pretty model independent manner. And therefore, I believe that I think that this can provide a strong and involved test of MW normal itself or, or any theory that you might have in mind on its own. And let's remember that kinematically, we've been talking about around 500 GeV or 700 GeV scale, which can be already within the LHC reach now or will be comfortably within the range of a future collider, right? For sure. A lepton collider will be beautiful. Like one TV lepton collider, that's the king in this business. It can do anything, everything. Um, however, we have learned, for example, by, by hammering the Suji theories that uh, nature is very good at hiding. You have a squeeze limit, this and that, you're sort of lying, island, and so on. Yes. Uh, zero, good, uh, that's the next slide, very good. So, so hold on to that. You should ask, right? Why am I not talking about here at all? Good, I'll, I'll get to that, thanks. Um, so going back to this point, so yes, this will provide a, at the very least a complementary test to the theories, but in case those guys are want to hide in some squeeze limit by kinematical reason, then this can, can still go, go for it and hunt for it. So since you ask, what about this? Looks like there are a lot of points there. Why am I not talking about that? Important question. So let's ask, when can I achieve this with still sizable shift in the MW? We can understand that. So I show you this, this formula before. And then I said that for now, just remember that there are two times with the minus sign. So certainly it is possible to cancel out to make a very small correction to the coupling while having sizable shift in W mass. Let's think a little bit more, what kind of tuning we are talking about actually? There are at least the four parameters. They have to play out together to cancel out independent parameters. But to me, slightly more uh, concerning part is that there's a weak scale here. And then there is a new physics scale with a mass scale on its mass scale and the couplings. Somehow in order to achieve a very small, you know, we're talking about now 1%, 1%, let's say, 
That means that some new physics should know, oh, there's a weak scale. Let's, let's play it together and then make a cancellation at the level of 1%. It's possible. I'm not saying that theoretically it's impossible. But if you think about it, if you throw out you know, general random 700 GV, two of them, order one coupling together, and then with the 240 G, uh, 246 GV, what is the chance? You all, all happen to have that cancellation. And indeed, this scatter plot shows that chance, right? So yeah. Nature may play with us still, as it has done so far, it just giving us that puzzling piece. But that's a great question, right? So if we get to that point, we have a good question, rather than just saying, OK, yeah, what it is what it is, right? So we have more to, under, to be understood if that happens. But to me, on a general ground, so if, if we want to plan you know, what we should do in the future, I think we have to plan based on the natural consideration first. And yet, in addition to that, maybe subtle thing can happen, which we, we, we should still understand. So that's here. My attitude is that let's play out more natural game first and try to make a possible uh, future plan based on that, and then we can move on. All right, so, okay, I'm already a little bit running out of uh, time. So we, we can learn a little bit more other messages. For example, obviously shift in the coupling has a correlation with the, obviously the mass of the lightest state state. As you increase the mass, obviously there's a suppression effect because the decoupling phenomena, so they get smaller. But again, there's a clustering effect. But, but one thing that I want to show this plot quickly is that this plot, this plot show uh, the shift in the coupling as a function of you know, the ratio of S parameter contribution to the MW to T parameter contribution to the MW. In other words, generically, are we talking about T parameter induced effect or we're talking about something like S parameter dominant effect? And this shows that uh, uh, S parameter makes contribution roughly 10% compared to T parameter. So still we're talking about, you know, uh, mostly custodial symmetry violating effect that deriving most of the effect for generating MW rather than some other effect. Okay, so that's the message here. And lastly, I don't know, uh, maybe you, you, you have heard about this, this uh, tension already, but let me just point out to you this quickly. So here I just draw again some number of data points. I plot the MW and then you know, uh, left, effective leptonic uh, weak mixing angle. This red is rolled average today. And then here is the one sigma band, here is two sigma band. This is the measurement only based on slack. And then again, one sigma, two sigma. Okay, now let's look at it. Let's take a two second to take a pose. You see, first of all, wow, there's a strong correlation. This is not even random, right? There, there is something going on. Obviously, we can understand this. But second of all, if this is correct, and then if CDF is correct, I should live here. That's the, the CDF band. That means I should be here. So obviously, there's a tension with the world average, right? So first of all, this correlation it has a very easy and quick uh, explanation. So in, again, in key dominant case, I show already to you that, yes, it is a key dominant in general, so I can now accept it as a lesson. So T diamond in the case, MW is a linear function of T. One can also show that the shift in the sine squared theta is also a linear function of T. Obviously, you can just have a correlation. That's why you see this obvious negative correlation. Okay, but here really the point that I want to draw your attention to is that if this is true, then we have to understand this tension too. I don't have answer to, but I'm just pointing out that there is this uh, tension in principle, if this is correct. Why we have to drop all other measurements but SLD. Right, so that's the tension. All right, with that, let me just end. What's the lesson? I think that generically, for the size of the WMS and WMS shift that we need to explain CDF, generically, one should expect order of 5 to 10% deviation in the Higgs couplings. Okay? Again, the, the reasoning was that these are looping this even within the standard model. Right, so it's very easy to make a shift. And this is large enough already to be constrained today or can be very well tested in the near future. For example, if you have a lepton collider with a 250 GeV central mass, it will hammer this question immediately, right? If we don't even need a luminosity, it will just answer that immediately. So if CDF result is correct, then there's good chance that, so that means that I'm now I'm talking new physics, right? So there's a second evidence we should see pretty soon, which is exciting either from the coupling constant shift or may hopefully just discovery it, just directly producing it, that would be better. Now, generically, I didn't have time to, but the uh, Higgs to glue glue tends to be larger than 
takes the gamma gamma by roughly factor of three in a very completely modern independent manner, almost. Yes. Oh, so if a scalar is not colored, then yes, this is zero. So here, here, if I assume that there is a sector with both colored and charged, then I'm saying that there is this almost model independent formula. Right. Right. But of course, you can turn it off in principle. You might say then, is it, then is it too, too hard to probe? You might say that. Today, then, you, you will see the shift roughly 2 to 3%, as I told you. But remember, if we, we get a lepton collider, we can get to the 1% level. So we will see eventually, even if it is not colored. So with this correlation tells me that uncolored new physics is slightly harder to probe. OK? But ultimately, we should be able to see something, even without a color. OK. And like I mentioned, if CDF2 is a resu result is correct, then we should think about together as a community, how about this the size square data problem? All right, with that, let me end. And thanks for your attention. And uh, thank you very much. So question or comment? Oops, did I mess up something? Uh, yep. Well, I think the, maybe some of you already asked, but the, suppose you don't have a, I mean, in the new physics sector, you don't have a colored particle, only yep. electrically charged case. Yeah. So that Higgs to gamma gamma, only Higgs to gamma gamma and the C gamma can change. Yeah. So in that case, uh, uh, what's, what's the prospect? The, that's one question. And how about the shift in the Z bosom mass? Oh, the shift in the Z bosom mass. So here, here, uh, the the way I played out entire talk is that because the CDF result has MZ, which is completely consistent with the world average, only the MW gets shifted compared to the MZ. So already I assume that the whatever new physics to explain the CDF is in such a in such a way. That MZ is, is just remain as it is, like in the standard model, only MW gets boosted up. True. Right. So so that's why that's why most of the model that explain current anomaly is a T dominant, right? It's a T parameter dominant, meaning I don't want to touch Z as much. Only I want to extract the extra custodial symmetry breaking to just boost up the MW. But you can ask whether, given a theory, whether whether you, you can also have MZ shift. That's a great question in general. Uh, but, but we haven't investigated that, but I think that's it. Uh, we included the both S and T as a possible sources, but it, the, the outcome, uh, in part because of the Z, MZ and so on, the outcome is that it's a T parameter dominant case. So, so you just keep the MZ as it is, only just the boosting of the MW by extra custodial symmetry violation. You mean in this, which field you're talking about? Yeah. Here, yeah, here, here. Yeah, basically, I played out that I don't touch much NZ, but I only, only want to. Yes. Okay. Uh, any question from Ju? Uh, okay. Uh, if not, then let's thank speaker again. Thanks very much. Thank Thanks.